Today on Call Out, Whistler Sar searches for two pilots missing from a crashed military jet. It's going to be a closed search grid, and hopefully we find something. The ejection seats had ended up in the lake. Saturday, 9.30 a.m. Search and rescue crews arrive at their rendezvous point in the heavily forested Callahan Valley just outside of Whistler and gear up for a mission. Their objective? Locate signs of two missing Royal Canadian Air Force pilots whose plane crashed approximately two and a half kilometers southwest of here. We're on location here in the Callahan Valley. Uh, we're just assigning teams right now and going over our search parameters. It's going to be a closed search grid and hopefully we find something. On an arc. We're, we're presuming that that's the drift of the parachute. 37 members from Whistler, Pemberton, Squamish, Lions Bay, and North Shore SAR teams are tasked to comb the subalpine backcountry for any trace of the missing pilots. But there's a catch. The plane crashed over five decades ago. So this is a very unique uh, incident for us to participate in, in that it's kind of like cold case files meets search and rescue. We believe the clues will still be evident and uh, so it becomes real for us to try and find those and determine what actually happened. Before they move out, the teams are briefed on the history of the case. On March 22nd, 1956, two pilots from 409 Squadron departed from CFB Comox on a routine instrument flying practice on the Canadair Silver Star also known as the T-33. With a single turbojet engine that could propel the aircraft to speeds of 965 kilometers per hour, the T-33 was widely used around the world for military training and air shows. The pilots had intended to fly 110 kilometers northeast of Comox, do a 180 degree turn, and head back to base for landing. But 24 kilometers into the flight, weather interference caused the plane to disappear from radar. Shortly after, air traffic control lost communication with the crew. As fate would have it, uh, that aircraft never did return back to its space. Witnesses reported hearing an unusually loud jet flying 30 kilometers northeast of Comox, near Cortez Island. The Canadian forces immediately mounted an extensive search in the area, but nothing was found. For 18 years, not a single piece of evidence was recovered from the crash. It was widely believed that the T-33 had simply sunk to the bottom of the ocean. But in 1974, an unexpected turn of events. Outdoor enthusiast Howard Rode and his hiking party stumbled upon the canopy of a plane deep in the woods. I was up there leading a, a mountain, mountaineering trip to Mount Callahan, and one of the fellows had gone up hiking, and he found the, the canopy up on a, on a ridge, and I decided to go up there and look at it. The framework was okay. The plexiglass, it got almost completely demolished. Years of pressure under the snowpack had crushed the canopy, but luckily the serial number was still legible. Howard immediately reported it to the Canadian forces who matched it to the missing T-33. The discovery was a significant one. It placed the crash site 125 kilometers east of Cortez Island in the heart of the Callahan Valley. Canadian forces renewed searching around the area where the canopy was found but did not find any sign of the pilots or the fuselage. But the story of the missing T-33 did not end there. Hoping to find more clues, Howard Rode and his hiking friends returned to the Callahan Valley every summer, where they eventually crossed paths with Whistler search manager Brad Sills. In the 90s, I ran across uh, two older gentlemen who told me that they'd found uh, jet fighter canopy up on the ridge of Callahan Mountain. And that's when I first learned about this jet fighter that had crashed. Brad, who was building the Callahan Valley Ski Lodge at the time, was instantly drawn to the mystery. 
I've taken an interest in the case and um, uh, I've taken the time to research some files and find what I can. But it would be pure speculation for, for me to suggest what might have caused it, uh, other than the fact that we do know that the weather was not optimal on that day. That day, March 22, 1956, fog, low visibility, and turbulent conditions were reported in and around Comox. However, veteran T-33 pilot Don Wensley is quick to dismiss this theory. The weather should not have been a factor. These damn things will fly in very, very difficult circumstances. But to crash into the mountains, especially a low-lying mountain like Callahan, that's not the result of a pilot getting disoriented because of clouds and rain. That's not understandable. The only thing I can imagine would cause this is not pilot error, but machine uh, failure. 1997, more than 20 years after the T-33 canopy was found and no further evidence of the missing aircraft and its two pilots. Then, a series of events breathed new life into the case, starting with an unusual occurrence at the construction site of SAR manager Brad Sill's Callahan Valley Ski Lodge. I recall that it was March 22nd and Ken and I had, uh, we'd been playing cribbage or something downstairs and then, then we went to bed. It was about 1.32 in the morning. I had been sleeping for a, a couple of hours and then suddenly I was sat bolt up right in bed and I looked and I saw a really hazy type of, of it looked like a person in the doorway looking at me. What jumped first into my mind it was the Ken and I said, Ken, what's, what's up, what do you want? And um, he turned around and, and walked away towards the stairs. I didn't really think of anything, and I never even mentioned it to Ken at breakfast, but until he asked me if I had gone down the stairs during the night. And I said, well, no. He goes, oh, come on. Like he was, I heard this really loud steps, bang, bang, bang. They were complaining to each other that each party had made a lot of noise during the course of the night, and what were they doing coming in their rooms anyways? And a little bit of bickering over the coffee was going on, and it soon became apparent that it wasn't a person at all, but uh, an apparition. An apparition that happened to show up on the anniversary of the T-33 crash. March 22nd, he said, that's the day that the plane crashed in the Callahan in 1956. And, uh, you know, look, everybody got a little shiver out of that. Just a few months later, a major discovery was made. The fuselage was actually found by a uh, British Columbia Force Service um, fire patrolman that was uh, doing aerial reconnaissance. Well, I remember quite well. It was August 7th, 1997, and we were looking for an area to stage the helicopter and get access to the fire. And as we were looking down through the timber and I saw what looked like, I thought, a uh, garbage dump or just some kind of debris on the ground. What he had spotted was actually the wreckage of the doomed T-33. It was found about two kilometers south of the canopy. Crash site itself where the plane was is probably about 20 meters by 20 meters, so it wasn't that large at all. It was in very good shape because it came in in the winter, I think that was one of the reasons that it was largely well preserved because it came in in a lot of snow. The find revealed two things. One, no mechanical failure or malfunction was detected. Rather, the engine appeared to have failed in flight due to fuel starvation, the cause of which remains undetermined. Two, the seats were not inside the fuselage, leading investigators to believe that the pilots had successfully ejected from the plane. So the, the sequence of events would have been the canopy goes, then the ejection seat goes, then you kick yourself out of the seat and the parachute opens, and the meanwhile the plane is cruising on ahead. But the ejection seats were never found. The theory was that somehow the ejection seats had ended up in the lake and that's why they had never found anything in the two searches that had been conducted. So why search now? More evidence. Two of uh, my employees, Evan and Kirsty, uh, were out uh, one day last October when they came across a new clue. Hey, just check this out. What do you think this is? 
We're the caretakers up at the Callahan Lodge, so um, we're having a quiet day up there. So we thought we'd go out and do some hiking. Evan was in front of me and he was just walking along and I see him looking down, like picking at something, kind of wondering what he's found. And he's um, pulled it up and he's like, do you think this is a helmet of some sort? And I'm like, I don't know. It was indeed a helmet, but not just any helmet. This has been identified as the flight helmet from 409 Squadron. They can tell that by the colours there on the side of the helmet. There wasn't any head inside, but the thought did occur to us. <laughs> so when we turned it over, it was a little bit of trepidation there, but alas, no head. <laughs> this new discovery was a key factor in prompting Whistler SAR to mount today's large-scale, multiple-team ground search. The helmet sort of gives us some definitive proof that the pilots were on the ground. Even if this helmet was carried here by wildlife, the wildlife didn't pull it out of the lake. So we know they were on the ground somewhere in the vicinity and we're just trying to find some evidence of where they actually were and, you know, potentially there might still be human remains, but probably unlikely. After 55 years, the odds of finding human remains and bones are very slim. But if any are found, they will be sent to a lab for DNA testing. Difficult to say if there's going to be enough material there to do DNA. Of course, you'd have to have something to compare it with, and that would be uh, familial DNA from uh, family members. So today, we're going to just do block B. Based on the location of each found item, and keeping in mind several terrain features, SAR managers have devised a search grid made up of seven high probability areas. Today, the teams will comb Block B, a one kilometer by one kilometer zone with a steep gradient and rugged subalpine terrain. The searchers make their way down the trail to the southern edge of Block B, where they will break up into 11 teams of three. So if you look down there, there's a blue one there. That's one wingman and there's your other wingman there. Each team consists of one compass person and two searchers. The compass person will guide the team north in a straight line, while the searchers sweep back and forth along a corridor of 20 meters on either side. Once they reach the northern boundary of Block B, each team will shift 60 meters to the west and continue sweeping downhill. I think this presents a unique opportunity to people that are coming into search and rescue as well as, you know, more experienced people to really look at how we do search and, and what, we, what we are looking for. If it's too much, you just stop. Let Martin How far know. is it to the top? Five minutes to go. 700 feet. Up. Yeah. Oh, that's nothing. <laughs> I would like to get up there and have a look at it because I don't understand how the seats have never been found and yet the canopy and the helmet has been found. Absolutely, I'm going. <laughs> now, when I find the seat, and when you find I'm the not seat, 11:30 a.m. The teams move into the forest, eyes peeled for any clue. Fifty-five years later, the mystery of the ill-fated T-33 still manages to capture the imagination of those who live and work in BC's coastal mountains. We got engaged in the whole process of the mystery and uh, we can look for some more clues and uh, who knows, perhaps get to the bottom of it. I think it would be great to finally have closure on this whole story and if we could find some proof uh, with the ejection seats I think it would be a great ending to the story and I would feel fulfilled. However, finding the seats won't necessarily confirm that the pilot survived. In fact, the act of ejecting itself carries many risks. The ejection systems in the T-33 and the CF-100, they weren't perfect. One of the problems uh, was if your head was down, when you ejected a seat, usually it would break your neck and you'd be killed before you got out of the plane. And sometimes when you eject, your plane's out of control. Something has gone wrong, so you're going straight down. Also, at 40,000 feet, there's no oxygen. And if you open your chute, you've died from lack of oxygen by the time you get to 20. 
So those were experiments and problems that had to be overcome. But search manager Brad Sills has reason to remain optimistic. Back in the 1980s, he came across an old campsite in the Callahan Valley. I do remember there being logs that had been assembled in, uh, in a seat fashion and sardine, open sardine cans and a tremendous amount of parachute cord, which we thought was a bit odd, but uh, didn't really spend a lot of time thinking about it. The parachute cord indicated that this was no ordinary campsite. Was it left behind by none other than the missing pilots? Well, certainly in the years that followed, when I did find out about the crash, my mind went back to the earlier discovery. You know, that's what has propelled me for a number of years, trying to relocate that uh, particular campsite. The train's very undulating, it's very wet. We've gone through some old growth forest, and now as we're getting into the subalpine, we're getting more into smaller shrubs, smaller trees and uh, getting more into the cloud cover. Today, the teams must slog through relentless October rain and contend with muddy slopes and fallen logs. But on March 22nd, 1956, conditions on the ground would have been even more difficult. In March, a typical year in March, there would be meters of snow. It could be hard, but then it could be soft. It could be up to your hips. And if it's anything like that, I, I mean, it would be very, very difficult, and, and the odds of surviving aren't great. In 1956, there was no highway here, and so there would be very little distinguishing marks of habitation or human activity. There's no logging, no prospecting yet, no anything, so that had been in the middle of the boonies, and probably best guess for them would have been just head downhill, and hopefully they could follow a creek to civilization. Okay, 4,760. Doug, we've reached our destination here, the correct elevation. An hour and a half into the search, Team 3 has reached the northern boundary of Block B. They haven't come across any clues, only more rain. We didn't see anything. There's The snow seems like it's accumulating a little bit more now. The precipitation's still coming down pretty hard. Man, this is Team 10. Overalls. This is definitely a set of overalls on the stump. Another team has reported a find. Yeah, with the number 101 painted on them. We uh, took a closer examination of it. It appears to be some blue overalls from a previous uh, SAR exercise in 1995. Uh, certainly it looks too new to uh, belong to uh, uh, the people that we're searching for. So where do you want to move to? Just go over? We'll just go over that way, yeah. Uh, Having reached their destination, Team 10 heads back down to their starting point. They uncover two more items on their descent. Again, both are too new to have belonged to the missing pilots. 1.45 p.m. Teams who have completed their task regroup and compare notes. I was hoping I could have these coveralls, I need some at work. <laughs> there you go. Besides more coveralls, teams have also found small blocks of wood. Our team found one piece of wood painted number three on it. The blocks have no relation to the T-33 crash, but they do serve a purpose. So what this is, is we seeded the, uh, the actual search area with nine of these. And so from this, we're now going to be able to extrapolate and determine what the probability of detection was based on how many of these we get back. We have found a white block with the number five on it alongside a Good. bottle of single bog mangalubin. <laughs> Out of the nine blocks, six were located. This means that there was a 65% chance of finding something in that particular search area. Back at command center, each team's GPS tracking data is plotted on the map. This is useful in identifying areas that may have been neglected during the search. Although nothing from the T-33 crash was recovered, the mission is nevertheless considered a success. The object of uh, getting together mutual aid teams like this is just 
basically to cement those bonds and, and learn to work together. So uh, that was certainly very successful. It was a great day out there, um, a great exercise. If we would have uh, found uh, any sign of the, uh, the missing airmen, it would have been a bonus, but uh, you know, uh, they're still out there and uh, we'll be back next year. Plans are already in place to return next year and cover another one of the search blocks. My recommendation uh, to the Provincial Emergency Program will be to use this as a training ground for all ground search and rescue training over the coming years. But while this cold case provides an excellent training opportunity, ultimately the goal is to solve the mystery of the T-33 crash that claimed two lives. Eventually, uh, given that kind of commitment to it, we will find those seats, there's no doubt about it. Call out search and rescue features, real stories filmed live by search and rescue teams during actual missions. Find out more at calloutsar.tv.